السلام عليكم مساء الخير Good evening everybody My name is Abraham Sareh I am a neurosurgeon and we are transmitting live to our international audience from the Farah Medical Campus here in Amman, Jordan The topic for tonight would be petrochlybal meningitis. So we need to discuss what is petrochlybal, which area <coughs> the scar base is that, and we'll discuss the meningitis in that part. So anatomy again for an immunosurgeon surgeon is a must. Uh, you cannot mention anatomy of the nervous system without mentioning Albert Rotten from Gainesville, Florida. He's the master of anatomy. He taught us anatomy that we did not know before. And I'm really proud that I, I knew this man very close. Uh, he passed away three, four years ago. So these are the bones of the skull. Skull base. This is the spheroid bone. This is the temporal bone, the occipital bone. They join together. So this part of the temporal bone joins this, which is the chivus. So we speak of petroclival. So this is the skull base, anterior fossa, middle fossa, posterior fossa. This is the temporal bone in relation to the clivus. Again, this is the clivus. This is the petrous bone. We make connection here. And you can see the cranial nerves and the skull base. So we classify the clivus into upper, middle, the lower clivus, upper zone, middle zone, lower zone, and there is an angle between the clivus and the petrous bone. So it is not flat, there is an angle. And that makes it difficult for surgeons. This angle is to be appreciated only by people who work there. This is small, few centimeters in length, few centimeters in width. In Arabic, it's a small bone. The clivus is a small bone. Everything is there. Adjacent nerve, trigeminal nerve, seventh, eighth nerve, and the lower cranial nerves and the upper lucid nerve. All condensed in a small area. Again, this is a picture I took when I was training at Albert Rotten lab in Florida. And this is a picture I took myself from one of the cannabis. And this teaches you well. Nothing can teach you anatomy and how to use this anatomy in surgery except if you do cadaveric uh, studies. Again, two basilar arteries joining to form basilar, two vertebral arteries joining to form basilar artery, and the branches, the tica, the ica, the superior cerebral and posterior cerebral artery. The relationship of the nerves, the sixth nerve, transgeminal nerve, seventh, eight, lower cranial nerve, nine, tenth, eleventh, and the uh, hypoglossal So that's the picture that you would like to imagine in your brain, in your mind, if you want to operate in that area. The region is here, between the petrous and the clivus. So it's here. Imagine somebody putting you something there and is asking you to remove it. So you have to keep this image of where every structure is. Again, seventh nerve, to imagine the nerve going to make a scale, seventh, eighth, 9, 10, 11, and hypoglossal. If you look at it from above, you will be working here, this small space there. Magnify it, you will be working here, between the petrus and the clivus, in this angle. Again, you have to picture it in your mind, not only the arteries, the nerves, brainstem, cerebellum, but also the venous sinuses. This is called basilar venous sinus. This is the inferior betrothal sinus, speed betrothal sinus. This is the sigmoid sinus. And when you come to the clivus and petrus, if you remove the dura, you will also have this uh, plexus or veins there. So it's a complex anatomy that anybody who wants to operate there must be mastering it. Same picture. Abducent, transgeminal, subunit, lower cranial nerves, hypoglossal. Looking at it from the side, you will be working here. And this 
easy. What well, every important structure is the crust of the brain, the arteries, the nerves, and everything. Try to the nerve and the cascade. And these people taught us about the anatomy of that area. Gruber, gardening, and Rado. They gave us these uh, names that we need to know. So this is the climbus, this is the pituitary, third nerve, fourth nerve, sixth nerve, so I'm using the nerve and the plexus. Another beautiful paper by Arthur Kabebenke and Majid Sami of that particular area. So you see the trigeminal nerve, underneath it is the carotid, this is a gruber ligament. If you remove the trigeminal, you will find the carotid artery and the gruber ligament. If you remove the gruber ligament, you will see the neuronal canal through which the sixth nerve passes. It's no more acceptable that patients should come out with clinical nerve deficits. In the past, oh, it's a brain surgery, so the patient dies or hemiplegic is accepted. It's no more acceptable. So these papers uh, construct our anatomical knowledge of this particular area, the trigeminal nerve, what's the relationship with the petrosal sinus, is it underneath it, is it above it, or is it enclosed between those two areas. So we know now what is petroclimber. Let's speak about the Germans. Harvey Cushing, the father of neurosurgery uh, from Harvard, uh, this is the period that he lived. He classified this. He gave the name of meningioma. He coined the name meningioma. So meningiomas could be anywhere. They are the most common benign tumor in our brain. So we should know it. Subratentorium above the tent, 90%. Below the tent, 10%. This is the tent. So, when we speak about petroclavar meningioma, what are we talking about? Is this good area or this area? People differ in their explanation and we will go through that. So people agree now and we will be the final ultimate agreement that it is medial to the cranial nerves, fifth, seven and eighth. So we're talking about this and the upper two-thirds of the climbers. Lower climbers is not part of this. Lower climbers is for and magnum. So upper two-thirds of the climbers, medial to the nerves. So we're talking about this area. <coughs> so people like William Caldwell from South York <coughs> City with Fukushima, Takanuri, Taki. Again, they say this is the area where the visual climber region arises. William Shaker from Seattle, the United States, he said, if the meningioma arises from petrous stretch medial to the internal detrimators, it is called petroclavar. So anything medial to the internal detrimators is called petroclavar meningioma. Majid Sami from Hanover, Germany. I talked about him a lot because he is a man who gave us our knowledge about how to operate in that area. He said, well, let's agree. Infratentorium meningiomas are either on the cortex of the cerebellum. Cerebellum has three surfaces, the occipital surface, the tentorial surface, and the petrous surface, to the cortical meningiomas, and then the lateral petrous group, and then the cerebellum in time group, and then petroclimate. So there's a huge difference between petroclimate and cerebellum in time in Germany. And there are both, in third world countries, these are all amalgamated into meningioma of the cerebellum in time, which is wrong. Cerebellar convexity meningioma. This is convexity meningioma. This is paper by Michael Sergu from San Francisco. This is called, it's not petroclimate, it is cortical. So even the nomenclature is not correct. This is cortical. This is, these are my cases. This is cortex. So cortical meningioma. Superficial. But this time I said, well, cerebellum and tamagal meningiomas are the next group. They are centered around the 
internal determinators either they are before it or centered on it and they are behind it. So let's look at that. Post meter, so behind the meters. Look at this. This is the meters and this is the tumor. So this is behind or post meter. Centered over. This is the internal determinators centered. And you may easily, easily miss this for a vestibular schonoma. It is a meningioma centered over the internal determinators. These are my cases. Centered over. Again, all these cases I'm showing are my cases. Look at this here. If they are centered around the meters, so they could be above it or below it. So we're speaking about supra meters, above the meters, or below the meters, infra meters. So petroclavial meningioma is totally different from the cortical meningioma, from the lateral petrous meningioma, from the meningiomas that are called cerebellum and tan angle, which are having relationship with the internal determinators. So look at this. We are medial to the internal determinators. This is a true petroclavial meningioma. We can call them clival meningioma. So Majid Sami said, meningiomas arising from apical petrous bone, upper two thirds of the clavus, medial, not medical, medial to trigeminal nerve, are petroclavial meningiomas. They constitute 5% of the meningiomas. But they can extend. They are not only there. We can go to Michael's cave. We can go inside the internal determinators. Go to jugular foramen. We can go to foramen magnum. And any combination of the above. Here, the meningioma went into the jugular foramen. Here, it went into the internal canal. Here, it went into the cave. Or it can overflow. Look at this. It's overflowing to everywhere. Again, these are my cases. Sometimes they are lost for definition. What would you call this? Petroclival or clivus or cavernous or whatever. So this is the image that people should have in mind. This is a petroclival meningioma found in the caliber. And this is the relationship of, with, the, with the brainstem and with the nerves. So you have put something in front of everything. Look at this relationship of these meningiomas with the structures that we mentioned. What's the natural history of these meningiomas? So the natural history suggests that they progressively grow with progressive neurological deterioration and death. This is the natural history. So you have to go for excision to provide the only chance of a cure. No other way of treatment will give you a chance of a cure except surgery. And these regions, they grow. So, <coughs> this is one in the German. This is four years later, no change. Five years later, no change. Six increased, ten years increased. So they tend to grow. Having said that, this paper from Germany, this calcified meningioma remained the same after seven years. So there is odd cases, there are odd cases. In my series, I discovered this uh, petroclavial meningioma. And this lady continued following her up and did not change whatsoever. What's the management? You may observe, you may do surgery, you may do radiotherapy. Let's discuss. When do you observe these cases? If they are small, asymptomatic, or found, found incidental, or medically unstable, you are given the chance to observe. Surgery? This is recent. Up to 1970, they were inoperable. People would not even think of doing surgery for them. And then, things... With, with, with the signs and symptoms, yes. They grow with signs and symptoms. <coughs> if, if the patient to step has... Up, to step down the 
Yes, a heart simple, like simple headache, a slight numbness in the face, and it is not increasing, yes, so who would wait? So complete surgical removal is the optimal, optimal treatment. But this should not be achieved at the expense of the patient. It's not an, I am the courageous superman your surgeon, I want to remove the tumor, so that I would give you a good picture. I have to respect the patient. I should not be courageous on the expense of the patient. But my aim is to remove it completely, if I can. So, not to remove totally, regardless, but to attempt complete resection by optimizing the surgical conditions. So it is a good anesthetist, a good neurologist, a good neurosurgeon, a good oncologist to do this kind of surgery. Gross total resection is reported in about 50%. Why gross total resection? This is Simpson grade 2, not Simpson. Nobody can achieve Simpson grade 1 in the posteriors. But gross total resection is reported in more than 50% of patients. Papers, Germany, 97. This is Johann Stramm, the chairman of the uh, German uh, Neurosurgical Society. He's retired now. Look at this. Radical resection. Radical resection is always the best option. The answer is yes, except for this that is going into the cavernous sinus. We do not operate on the injomas going inside the cavernous sinus. We learn that we cannot kill them. But anything else, we should remove. How do you reach to that area, difficult area? So many approaches: retrosigmoid, retrosal approaches, transplant line, transcochlear, middle fossa approaches. So these are the many approaches that has been invented. Look at this. You have to imagine how to reach that. You want to reach here. So subtemporal, transmetrosal, retrosigmoid, and so on. Paper 92, Miriam Shaker from Seattle. He used the subtemporal approach. 92. Subtemporal approach also was described by other authors. Large and giant petroclavular angiomas have the choice of microsurgical uh, excision. Again, subtemporal, you go underneath the temporal lobe, you incise the tintorium, and you can remove them. Petrosal, this is petrosal, superior petrosal science. You can come this way called anterior petrosal, you can come this way called posterior petrosal. And it is named after Kawase. Kawase is the a uh, Japanese neurosurgeon who discovered this approach by, by accident. He would tell you that he was doing some drilling in the cadaveric lab and he discovered that he can remove this one without making any problem. So he published this paper, Kawase 91, anterior transpetrosal approach. So this is when in general, comes anterior trosal and remove it. This is Takeshi Kawase. Uh, I'm proud to, again, be a member of the so many groups that uh, skull based surgery in the world has achieved. Here we are in the Asian a group, here we are in the international groups of this skull based surgery. He's a great man, and his wife is a great woman. This is when he invited all of us to Mount Fuji. But this is the World Federation. Precinct one, which is the posterior petrosal approach. So you come from behind. And this was championed by Al Mufti, Hussam Al Mufti from Syria, who migrated to the United States. He's one of the big shots of scalding surgery. And he put this into papers, 2009 how to do the steroidal and again another approach by MFT also describing the findings what are what, what are the sections that you will find and how would you see them how would you vision and these approaches he would do combined betrosal anterior and posterior betrosal for some difficult cases like this the so called the clival meningitis and he described in this beautiful illustration done by 
artist. Every department should have a network of artists. So that I, as a surgeon, I would come out and tell him what I think, and he would give it to me in drawing. This is totally lacking in the Jordan, Arab world, and the Middle East in general. But he came out and he said, some meningiomas like this, they have arachnoid between them and the brainstem. Double layer of arachnoid. Beautiful. He would tell you, give me hundred of these, don't give me any one of these. Why? Because there's only one plane of, of arachnoid between the tumor and the brainstem. And there are double arachnoid. And that's a nifty, again, close friend. And uh, we are in one group called the World Academy of Neurosurgery and we're having our meeting in Brazil in a month's time. Other people followed. Kenji Ohata from Japan also described the Petrosian approach. So there are masters and we learn from them. From China, the same thing. You would think this is impossible to remove. It is impossible in the hands of mediocre surgeons. That's why they go for gamma knife. They don't go for gamma knife because it is better. They go because it is the only thing they know. They know nothing else. Retrolabrantine approach from USA, from the Kidis, from Cleveland Clinic, and my friend uh, Walker Sickert from Germany describing this approach again, the same approach like uh, Ajit Sami. Retro Sigmund, again mastered by, as I said, Ajit Sami, and he will tell you these items. Surgical resection continues to be the first and best treatment. Treatment goal should be complete resection, which is the only potential curative option. He believe, we believe, his, his group, that the bitterclavian meningiomas are best removed in the simple and safe retrosigmoid approach. He does not want to go into pre-sigmoid and combined sigmoid. Retrosigmoid for him is enough, and I personally believe in this and adopt it. So this is the picture, <laughs> little signal, you drill the submeter bridge, so you see more, and you see these nerves in the retraction. And the paper from Japan, the same approach, little signal. So you can read it. Here they are putting, this is for neurosurgical residents, and they are neurosurgeon, they put this to avoid adhesions. So to me, it is more is the workhorse for these kind of tumors. This is from Anil Nanda, United States, Sandy Inter. So, surgery is, the aim is total. But when you go there, with this aim, with this determination, I want to cure the patient by removing this tumor. And you fail because of circumstances that it is stuck to the arteries or nerves or whatever to the rest of then you accept defeat, you do subtotal, and then you the surgery. So this is only done after this or this. Some people would say, and this is a trick by the so-called mediocre neurosurgeons who are practicing the radio surgery. Oh, it's big, so we cannot treat it. Everybody will blame us. So we're not go and remove part of it, and then the rest we will give down. This is wrong. And this is a statement from Ajit Sami. An approach that starts with the idea, you start with the idea of subtotal resection. And then the therapy does not serve the patient well regarding chances of a complete excision. So it is the state of mind. So primary goal before surgery should not be subtotal resection. Otherwise, this will lead to inappropriate surgery by inexperienced surgeons with significant morbidity and uh, compression of brainstem. There's severe compression of the brainstem and they still give the armor knife. You say, come on, the armor knife starts, you give it today, starts after six months, completes action in two years. Why should you keep the patient brainstem compressed for that period of time? They have no answer, except they push the button and take the money. So what's the histopathology of these tumors? 
some. Good evening. Mm. Uh, Better clival meningioma actually is not different than other types of meningioma. So we'll go on uh, what is the typical uh, histology of meningioma. This is the most common histology that we see in meningioma, which is the meningothelial meningioma. And you see, you see this cartwheel appearance uh, with some enormous bodies. Some of them are calcified. Uh, this is higher above where you can see many enormous bodies because these are ancient changes. Some of these bodies indicate dead cells that are calcified because of the ancient changes that are quite long standing in meningiomas. And the more some of bodies usually indicate probably the more progressive, innocent uh, meningioma or ancient meningioma. Sometimes you can see spindling, a uh, fibroblastic pattern, and this is, can be seen usually more in fibroblastic type meningioma. And you can see here, sometimes uh, you can see dense uh, because of hyalinized uh, uh, cells. Uh, and you can see here, very usually hypercellular. Uh, in this area, it's really converted almost to hypocellular or acellular areas because of the uh, very slow growing and a vascular supply to this area. Uh, typically, <coughs> all meningiomas should have epithelial membrane antigen positivity, but it's very important you have to recognize the pattern. Usually it is multifocal, it's not in all cells as you could see, and usually it is membranous in around membranes. Why I say you have to emphasize, because there are other tumors that can be positive in epithelial membrane antigens, for example, like epidemoma, but they have much different uh, the, uh, pattern than a meningioma. So it's very important you, as a immune staining, not only to call it positive, but also to recognize the pattern of immune staining. Progesterone, usually most of these uh, meningiomas, especially if they are grade one, uh, they are usually progesterone positive. And usually the more progesterone positivity, the better prognosis. And we have publication about uh, uh, progesterone as one of the good prognostic factors and grading for meningioma. B53 usually, usually is negative, even in the atypical meningiomas, but when it is positive, it's bad prognosis. Cases have been usually in low grade meningiomas or grade W or grade one. In our publication, it's usually at, uh, 1 1.5, 1%. If it is the grade two, which one is uh, five to six percent. If it is anaplastic, it may reach up to 20 percent. So this is uh, usually we call it a fibroblastic meningioma. If it is W, which is grade one, uh, and there are other types of meningiomas. <coughs> uh, this is one of the publications that we have predictive markers for meningioma grading, uh, okay. how to grade meningiomas. Uh, we use the tumor size. You can see. Uh, as you go from grade one to grade two, it's not much, but grade three usually they present with much larger tumor size. These are all our cases, uh, Dr. Rahim and me cases. Uh, atibia is more common. Uh, you can see even in grade one, you can see some atibia, but they are uh, usually few number of cells. But you can see in grade three, most of the cells are atypical. Uh, small cell component, Small cell component can be seen in usually most of the time in grade two and uh, other than other grades. Uh, so it's usually one of the features that is a typical meningioma, not uh, the benign one. Brain invasion, brain invasion usually is not seen by definition in grade one and is seen in grade two and much more common for almost all cases that we have in grade three or anaplastic meningioma, they have brain invasion. So brain invasion is an ominous sign. It used to be a WHO <coughs> classification in the 90s that uh, they consider when the brain invasion, this is called malignant. But they discovered, no, we, we really have to uh, not consider it as malignant. It can be grade two and still have brain invasion. And this is support, support uh, our uh, uh, study. Bone invasion, this is uh, <coughs> actually very important. And I mentioned to one of the most famous neurobiologists that came to Jordan, in the Dead Sea we had it. I, he attended this lecture. So I told him that bone invasion in his definition is not a case of uh, grading of meningioma. But I mentioned to him that this in our study, we had it, we had it, it's more common in uh, grade three compared to grade two to compare it to grade one. And then he commented on that, he said that 
Japanese and European consider this is part of the grading, but they are in higher grade, meaning Germans, in our study, uh, almost half of the higher grades, but it's much less in uh, lower grade, and the pattern also is much is different. Usually necrosis in the higher grade in German is geographic type necrosis, as if somebody is writing, uh, is drawing a map, but in the uh, smaller grade or lower grade, it's usually spotty, just small spots of necrosis. So it's very important not also to mention the necrosis, also to mention the pattern of necrosis. Mitotic count also is very, very important. Also, this is one of the things that we I differ with uh, from the, the new, new uh, the standard new pathology WHO classification. I told him that we found that grade two usually mitotic figures is 1.2 in our cases, and uh, this is an actual study. Uh, why the WHO consider four or more mitotic figures to uh, classify it as two? I think with with four, more probably we are missing some cases of two and uh, un uh, undergrading them as one. So I think we should really not consider four uh, mitotic figures as the, uh, the point of differentiation between grade one and grade two, uh, but still WHO, WHO consider it as a, a grade of a two is four and one or more. B53, most of them in Germans actually are negative B53. <coughs> even the higher grades, you can see even the higher grades, we usually they are negative. But when it's really present, it's more present in the higher grades. B63 also, B63, uh, we differentiate between whether it's nuclear staining or uh, cytoplasmic staining. Cytoplasmic staining is not much of importance in the grading, but when it is nuclear staining, it's more uh, common in higher grade meaning German. Progesterone, and the other way around, it's uh, inversely related to uh, meningioma grading. The more progesterone uh, receptors, uh, percentage, the better it grades. You, you can see in, in grade one, reaching up to 90%. Grade three, most of the time, it's really negative. Uh, case six, seven uh, that we mentioned, in grade one, usually it's 2.9. You know, it's the sixth uh, grade two, and it's very, very high in uh, grade three. We always use the case seven in all our cases, and I think it's very important. Still now, WHO uh, it does not consider case seven part of the uh, grading, although they consider it in the uh, calling it whether it's grade two or three or one, but not not part of the criteria. I think probably is going to probably change because there's not much data. But our study confirms that case seven is uh, really very important. Uh, in our study, we low grade more common in females, but higher grades are more common in males. Uh, atibia, small cell component, necrosis, bone invasion, brain invasion, necrosis, more common as you go, go from lower grade to higher grade. Mitotic figures, and I think this is very, very, very important in my opinion. In grade one, you can see some mitotic figures, but usually very uh, less than one. Uh, in grade two, uh, you can see is. The mitotic figures by 1.2 to 2. So f f I think any mitotic figures should be taken seriously. I don't think we have to wait really for four buttons or more to put grade two or grade three. Uh, and grade three usually is higher mitotic figures. Uh, markers like B53, B63 are more in higher grades, which is thrown in lower grades. Case, this is an important also. Case seven is uh, much higher in higher grades and lower in lower grades. Thank you. If the take home message tonight is to convince you that meningiomas are nasty tumors, then I have succeeded. Meningiomas are not benign lesions. Because if you can tell me one tumor in our body, in the human body, well, when you remove it completely, and it is a grade one, that it has a chance of coming back again in 10% of cases, then meningioma is not benign. Other than surgery, we can do endoscopy. And these are the famous endoscopists around the world. Charles II, Aminka Sam, Snyderman, Gardner, Gap, and Schwartz. And as I said, they produce beautiful anatomy. Like when Roton gave us the beautiful anatomy of microsurgery, these people give us the beautiful anatomy seen through the endoscope. So they have gone anteriorly, they have removed the climbers and they are looking front at the basal artery in the front of the brain stem. Beautiful anatomy. So they started removing some of these tumors in this place. This, the, also they, they mentioned and discovered 
and uh, reported the endoscopic anatomy of the arachnoid, which is again uh, give us further insight into what to do. Uh, endoscopy is endoscopic endonasia or endoscopic anterior vitrasectomy or endoscopic vitrasectomy. So they have different approaches, and these are the papers published for removal of vitro clivern in Germans. Can they remove it like a microscope? The answer is no. But it is for the future, and this is the future of neurosurgery. Again, not the clivern in Germans, not removed completely, but it is an attempt. Because this is the how the science is progressing. If we just let things be, as in the past, we will not progress. This is how to push the envelope, by discovering new methods. Again, clavel meningioma and endoscope still they have left some piece, but that's okay. In the future, they will succeed. Again here, leaving some. So different uh, approaches using the endoscope for these tumors, using the endoscope in the retrosigmoid approach, <coughs> and again from Italy, again this is from Paolo Camabianchi and his group in, uh, in, in Italy, with the using the endoscope. So what is the difference between microscope and endoscope? Microscope is 3D. Endoscope at this moment is 2D, but they are working on 3D endoscope. So once that is done and is popularized, the thing will explode. Learning curve of endoscope is longer. The corridors you are working through are narrow because of using the endoscope. You may cause vascular injuries, and if you do, then you cannot repair it because you are in a narrow corridor. So difficulty controlling bleeding, tumor consistency, if it is hard, you cannot remove it. You actually open the dura, so you will cause CSF leak, and there is some destruction of the nasal anatomy. These are the, the drawbacks of endoscopy, but they are going to improve in the future. But wouldn't the drawbacks of inability of controlling bleeding the way a surgeon would like to be a major hurdle for this? Absolutely it is. Absolutely. No doubt because they, no matter how good the surgeon is, as you very well know, you can't. bleeding yes. will happen. So Absolutely. And they have seen this when they're using the so-called supraciliary approach using the endoscope to clip an aneurysm. Mm -hmm. And then the aneurysm rupture, and then you have to convert to formal clinical. By that time, the patient is lost. So, endoscopy in general is restricted because of so many factors, so it is maybe used for a small mid-declival in the Germans. And that's Karu, who is a famous endoscopist. Most recent studies of endoscopy, many Germans are anatomical studies still there, mostly anatomical rather than clinical. Use of endoscope is not superior to microscope in particular for us. Still controversial. That's why Amin Kassan from Pittsburgh, he moved from Pittsburgh actually. Placing an endoscope, inserting and withdrawing, inserting and withdrawing through the cranial nerves is a blind process and carries a high risk. That's by Theodore Schultz from New York. The corridor between internal decimeters or canal and jugular foramen must not, must not be entered by endoscope by a Michael gap. So, it is, has a place, but its place definitely lies in the future. What about radiotherapy and radiosurgery? Don't give radiotherapy and radiosurgery up for it. That's not good. Everybody says that repeatedly, but those people would not listen. Radiotherapy mainly for this many geometers would be proton therapy, and proton therapy is only available for five centers around the world. <coughs> Remember, radiotherapy or radiosurgery carries the risk that we know, but we still use radiotherapy and radiosurgery. But don't use it as the first line. These are the cases treated by radiosurgery. Radiosurgery for para-internal detrical meningiomas. 
look at this here. I think you can read or not. Six months, twelve months, twenty-four months, and so on. You think there's any difference between this and that? They say this is control of the tumor. Control of what the tumor is still the same. Examples. Gamma knife, two years after. Oh, the tumor has shrunk, but it's still there. Five years, tumor is still there. Two years, tumor is still there. These are published papers from major centers. This is from Charlottesville, Virginia, which is one of the major centers of radio surgery. France, by John Regis from Marseille. The Amanai for this tumor causing pressure on the brainstem. Still they give it, the Amanai. You say, people, there is severe pressure on the brainstem. Your Amanai will start acting, start acting after six months, complete its action in three years. You cannot leave the pressure on the brainstem like this. We don't care. That's the answer I get in conferences. We don't care. One year later, still the same. Still the same two years later. As I said, they don't use the, they don't use the gamma knife because it's better for the patient. They use it because it is good for themselves. Look at this tumor and look here. There's no more brain stem. It is severely compressed. After five years, it's still compressed. They show you pictures, but we don't know what the patient is doing. Look at this and this. Can you tell any difference? No. This and this after four and a half years. We control the tumor. You did nothing, actually. Look at this. This is really... This is really <laughs> it's calcification. Decreased as calcification. As an Decreased calcification. <laughs> a brilliant new endpoint. Absolutely. Now, uh, this is by Jason Sheehan from Charles Reed, major neurosurgical neuro radiosurgery center. Look at this. That's the brainstem compressor, and this is the tumor. Still, they didn't get the gamma knife. I don't comprehend this. I would not ever prescribe to this way of doing things. Then they said, well, let's do surgery. This is big tumor. They would blame us if we treat this big tumor. So let's do surgery, remove part of it, and the rest we will give gamma knife. What's the end result? Very bad. Konziolka. Again, a major center in uh, USA. What does it say? Radio surgery should be considered as an initial option for small boy, small uh, and jobs. I agree with that. If the patient is not fit for surgery, but they don't. They treat patients across the board. Again, the same, the same center. Uh, small. Mr. Clive and Mary Jones. Of course, if they are small, they are, they are good for surgery. What should I give them? They do surgery. If they are large, it is not good for gamma knife. So, in both small and large, you should not be giving gamma knife. Again, here, Dead Lancet, Flickinger, and Conziolka, the same center. Resection, they, uh, they accept and they, uh, they, they admit it. Resection is uh, the first line option for these many jobs. But uh, during the last 20 years, still technical surgery has become an alternative option. It is an alternative option for those patients who cannot have the surgery because they are medically ill, very ill, or very old. Oh, okay, what can we do? They come up with an another trick. Let's give staged radio surgery. Radio surgery is to give the dose in one session. So you give it now. Within two hours, you give the 20 grays or 30 grays, or in the case of trigeminal and neurology, 90 grays. So they say we'll give radiation now, and five months later, we'll give another dose. Another stupid twist of mind. Because this is radiotherapy, it's not radio surgery. We mentioned that. So I've come to my series. It's a club in Nigeria from January 19 to 18. And my 18 were not considered the rest of 2018, 2019, because you have to leave two years.
You cannot include cases that you have done yesterday or the last year. And there they are. Each and every single case of them. 116 cases. But 34 patients were lost for follow-up, so I cannot present them. I have done the surgery and they disappeared. So how can I tell what's the result of my surgery? So we're left with 82. But 28 had short follow-up. To present many journals, you have to have long follow-up. And this is always we criticize the lady surgery that you have short follow-up. So we're not falling into the same trap. So we say we will not include these because they have short follow-up. So 54 had long follow-up. And these are the cases that I'm presenting. 54 of petroclavin angiomas that I operated and followed for long, long years. I'm talking in some cases 20 years, 15 years, and so on. Females, more than males. This is our fact. Many angiomas are common than females. And the reason is because you have estrogen and progesterone receptors. And the fact that many angiomas in females, the second and third trimester of pregnancy increase in size is well known, except in the Arab world and Middle East. Patient who's pregnant gets blind, it gets whatever. They say, oh, this is toxemia pregnancy. They never think of meningiomas increasing in size during pregnancy. So like other centers, like other publications, females in my series is more than males. And as Dr. Fasak said, females, they have grade one more, males have grade three more. So are equal. Uh, again, back to Kawasi, Takeshi, Takeshi Kawasi, he described this in his paper. He said, let's classify these petroclavos, not haphazardly. We'll call this Arclivos, this is Cavernous Sinus, this is the Tentorium, this is Petrosavix. So I thought it was a good idea. Very good idea. So I classified my cases according to Takeshi Kawasi, and he agreed to this actually and contacted him. So this is of our clivus. Just the clivus, and this is the attachment. If you look, what's the relationship here to the brainstem, to the posterior pleinoid process, with the trigeminal nerve, with the third nerve, it's different from other tumors called cavernous sinus star. So this is the tumor going to the cavernous sinus. So this relationship of this tumor is different from this tumor. So that would help you know what kind of Germans are dealing with. Third type is tentorial. Fourth type is petrus. So different relationship with the brainstem and the cranial nerves. So here we are. I classified my 54 cases into upper climbers, 20, cavernous sinus 15, tentorial 12, petrus apex 7. These are the upper climbers cases, 20 cases. These are all mine. This is the cavernous sinus. You can see they are going into the cavernous sinus. Tentorial, they are nearly at the tent. And the petrous apex, like this one. What was their presentation? Anything, of course, in the posterior fossa you can come up with. Attacks here, liver consciousness, etc. And look at this, depression. Be aware of depression in the nervous system. Lots of meningiomas present of depression. And in a study when I was in the UK, they went into the mental institutes who found people who were instituted in these mental hospitals. That was in the 80, 85. And they found that 20% of them, they had brain tumors. 20% published by the new in the journal of medicine. The cranial nerves, of course, they can be affected by what's the commonest? Confusion by location. So I use many approaches, but I love the retrosigmoid approach, but I'm not a prisoner of that approach. I use the uh, petrosal approach, the anterior and posterior and combined approaches and so on. And we do Karnofsky performance for all patients. I love the, uh, the posterior approach and we're doing it in the sitting position, I'm not a 
the uh, observation of a kind of function. How they are here? Yeah. We use for many uh, instruments like navigation and like kind of monitoring to know exactly what we do. Set setting position. We are masters of this. We have done hundreds and hundreds of kitchens. And this is a case of mine where I use the pre sigmoid approach. Gross total resection, you cannot remove Simpson blade one in Christian Foster. Not me, not anybody, not any master in the world. So you go for gross total resection. If you can't, you do near total resection or sub total resection. Look at the pillow. Minimum is two years. But look at this. This is the longest for her. Morbidity, of course. If you do surgery, you will have complications. The most important that you have a new cranial nerve deficits. And which nerve is that? Most likely sixth nerve. Surgical results were good, fair or poor, poor in four out of fifty-four. Did I have mortality? Yes. Two patients died, either during surgery or immediately after, or during the first month of surgery. This is called pretty operative mortality. What was yes. uh, bleeding? Bleeding or uh, dysfunction of the brainstem, basically. You are removing the tumor from the brainstem, and the brainstem does not tolerate this. So they remain in coma and they die. What was the histology time? Of course, the cases that Dr. Farsah mentioned are the cases that are between him and I, but I have uh, cooperated with many other pathologists in the past. So, transition is the commonest, but I had two pigmented cases, and this is one of them. Pigmented, removed, came back again. It's called melanocytic malignant time. This is the picture you see during surgery. This is flocculus, coronary plexus, Lower kind of nerve, seven eighth trigeminal. So we have to be familiar with this. And this is the severe betrothal vein of Dandy. Again, beautiful anatomy, but you have to master it for you to go and operate on a patient. Look at this beautiful picture. Lower kind of nerve, seven eighth trigeminal, sixth nerve. You are here. You will be operating here. So it has to be built in in your brain where to go. Picture that you see. Cranial nerves, when you open, cranial nerves are there and then the tube is in front of them. This is a picture where you can see the third nerve going into the cavernous sinus. This is pituitary stroke going to the pituitary. Look at this. This is the region of the, 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 the tumor was here. Here I'm working between two cranial nerves, between seven eight and the trigeminal. So you will learn to work between uh, cranial nerves, seven and lower cranial nerves. And this is the facial, and this is lower cranial nerves, and this is the adducent. So surgery can be done, but it has to be done by somebody who knows. And not to refer the patient to a radiation because you don't know. Again, picture that you see in the same position. This is facial nerve and this is the, uh, the uh, eye cap. And the tumor is in front of you. And this is the end result. Lower cranial nerves, 7 8 trigeminal reducent. So it can be done. Again, <coughs> beautiful CP angle. Free. This is microscope. Did I use gamma knife? I always speak against it. Yes, it's good, but you have to use it in the proper places. I'm not referring patients because I can't do surgery, let me do. So, in the period that I treated these patients 54 by surgery, I used the gamma knife in primary. I did not do surgery. I sent them for the gamma knife in nine cases. Or after surgery, they recurred and I used it in 11 cases. What are these cases? Cases that are difficult, but in patients who cannot tolerate such. Examples. We are covering the name and so on. This is when? Can you read? 2006. Okay? This is a tumor. 
of all 76, unfit for surgery. 73, unfit for surgery. I treated these patients, my grandmother. This is a patient with this tumor, the so-called cavernous type, upper clavus going to the cavernous sinus. So I went in, removed all the tumor except that in the cavernous sinus, and we agreed we don't operate on inside the cavernous sinus. So I gave this gamma knife, very fair. For this patient who had previous surgery, somebody removed his tumor alone, mediocre surgeon, did not accept that he cannot do surgery. He removed the timber lobe of a lawyer and rendered him really in a very bad state and the tumor was still there. So I went in and removed as much as possible and treated the rest with the MRI. I'm presenting to you the images of my series of cases. What did I learn? What can we learn from the images of these patients? CT is very important. The trochlear meningioma, look at this, calcification. It's important. Tumor infiltrating the vitreous apex. Look at this tumor destroying the peters. Here it's eating away the peters. So CT is essential. So you don't just do an MRI and say, oh, there's a tumor, let's hit it with gamma or let's operate. You have to learn more. So CT scan of the vitreous bone, MRA, MRV are part and parcel of this management. Look at this. Look at the calcification here. The internal detrimentus is open with calcification. It's MRI. On the MRI you would see hydrocephalus. Although the tumor is away from the ventricular system. It is not blocking the aqueduct of cereus. It is not blocking the fourth ventricle. But they develop hydrocephalus. The reason? When in germs and vestibular schwannomas, they secrete high protein and they would block and clog the arachnoid villi and they stop the absorption of senses. You look whether the tumor is unilateral or bilateral. But in this case, bilateral, you have to think of sarcoidosis. I did all the tests for sarcoidosis, it was negative. This was an unusual, unusual case of mine. Size could be small, could be huge. What is the origin from the clivus? Upper clivus, middle clivus, or all of the clivus? Shape, look at the shape and the regularity. It's all important. Are they going into the foramen? Yes, they are going into the foramen here. Origin of the clavus has mentioned. Is there any place of the cleavage? Yes, there is a good place of cleavage. This is a good case. Good case. This is a bad case. I would love that I disappear or the patient disappear. I don't like to operate on these ones. Look at here. Or here. So plan of cleavage is important. Look at here. There's no plan of cleavage whatsoever. Why are we looking at this? Because I have to be honest and to speak to the patient about prognosis and complications. Relationship with the brainstem. Look at this tumor inside the brainstem. Inside the midbrain, inside the pons. And it is nodular. Very bad case. Look at here. Imaginating itself inside the brainstem. Look at here, how much the brain stem is affected. They would give gamma an eye for this. Although the brain stem, they have no hesitation because they cannot operate. So this is the brain stem compression. And I swear to you, I swear to God, and I ask them these questions. How would you dare give this patient to the severe brain stem compression a gamma knife? The answer is, I don't care. Nodularity, look at this. This is a bad case. Nodularity, I mean. Relationship with the brainstem, causing edema. When you see edema, it means pyel invasion has been done. So the tumor is inside the neural tissue. 
and it will end with disasters. They may die. And these patients, I tell the relatives, your patient may die on table. That's the, the understanding of these edema cases. <coughs> edema, severe edema. What about the vascular relationship? Look at this tumor and look at the relationship with the posterior cerebral artery. So you learn a lot from doing the MRA. Look at here, the vertebral the vertebrae vertebra is completely compressed by this tumor. Here, it's pushed the basilar backwards. Basilar is inside the tumor. Basilar and its branches are inside the tumor. Please go away, see somebody else. Branches inside. These are all my cases. I'm presenting you the lessons I learned from my cases. Again, this is inside. No, they're fine. I would operate, but I would be honest with the patient and tell them what's the, what's the outcome. I will show some cases, actually. Again, look at here. You don't see the bed it's completely wrong. So it's important to do CT scan, CT scan MRA, MRV. If look at this MRV, you would know, you would imagine what is the tumor. Most important. My, my case is renal gram. What do you see? Persistent occipital sinus. That's why you have to do MRV. If you open it not knowing that this exists, once you open the dura, they will suck air inside, whether in sitting position or a prone position, the patient will die out of air embolism. You say, we don't need a MRV. Yes, you do. And you need to see what the severe vitrosal sinus is doing, what the inferior vitrosal sinus is doing, what the cavernous sinus is doing, what the sphenoid operator sinus is doing, superficial intracerebral, renal labe. So many information that we need to know. Venous system? Oh, it's nothing. Veins. <coughs> We cut them, it's not important, and the patient will die. Papers like this, like from Albert Rutten, describing the relationship of the severe vitrosal vein with the sinus, important. And this paper from Japan also. So many papers describing the venous anatomy that people do not know. People would sit for the exam, Jordanian board, Egyptian board, Pakistani board, Nobody will ask them about the venous system. They don't care. Beautiful paper by also by Hassan and Mifti about the vein of Lave. We called it Triangle of Bermuda. You may need to embolize these tumors. And this is one case that I embolized. It's coming from the external cavity, it's coming from the vertebral and its branches. So this is the case and this is the uh, embolization material. What's the differential diagnosis of these cases? Petroclidal meningiomas. Look at this. Huge. Why do we persist in saying this? Because if you just think of meningioma, your brain will get rusty. You will not think of anything else. May I just... I will just go through them and uh, ask you to comment. Look at this beautiful differential diagnosis that I came across. Beautiful. If it is extraaxial, if it is intraaxial, if it is in the skull days, T1, T2, the relationship. Let's go through them quickly. Schwannomas, Colomotor, Trochlear, they are all in the same case. Schwannomas, Davis Nabi Schwannomas, and the Jamas, of course. Jubilar phenomena, epidermoitiomas, acoustic neuromas, glioma going into laterally like this, epidermoid going laterally like this, chondrosarcoma, giant cell tumor, endolymphatic, endolymphatic carcinoma, yes, they do exist. Mandioblastoma, they don't only occur here, 
They are not all twisted. They can be totally solid. Like Oman, thrombus jugularis. Oh, it's easy. Let's go in. They would kill the patient. Neurosarcoidosis. Treated with a gamma knife. Metastasis. The same thing. Choroid plexus. Going through the gutter recess of the fourth ventricle. Lymphoma. Epidemoma. Atypical ATRT. And I cannot test. DNET. And so on. Chondroma, chondrosarcoma. I don't think I want to repeat them. Parcel medulloblastoma. And uh, cholesterol granuloma. We don't, we don't radiate cholesterol granuloma. Remember this. Gamma knife is given without histological verification. They don't do biopsy. They just oh, well, this is really John. Let's treat. That's the last question. Can I just finish this? Ice. and us take your question. <coughs> Lymphoma. Look at this. It looks very much like trochanter in John. And then was Thomas has to say to us, tuberculoma. And look at this paper. Beautiful paper. Designed to form the Wolfman's disease. It looks like the trochanter in John. Yet, it was not. Yes, please. Why do you suspect sarcoidosis in that case? Typically, it was bilateral. Bilateral. Other than bilateral. It's, it's the, one of the uh, causes of thick and dura. Sarcoidosis, yes, TB, post radiation, post operative, and so on. So, yes. whenever you see the thick and dura, does not mean this is an angel. It could be so many. Thank you. But again, any, those were his all histopathologically proven cases, so the proof actually wasn't methodology. Um, I cannot emphasize this enough. There is nothing benign about a benign brain tumor. Meningiomas that are not dealt with properly in the get-go, they, the patient is doomed for a, a horrible course of recurrent tumors, uh, uh, and, um, and that, uh, will, uh, uh, that will cause a lot of morbidity and mortality uh, in their life. Now, if I can just emphasize a few points here, where the, the, the implications would have been tremendous had this patient received radiotherapy serotactically with the idea that this is uh, meningeal. Now, imagine if you miss, uh, if you miss uh, chondrosarcoma, and you don't know that the patient has chondrosarcoma. Now, the mainstay of treatment would be optimal resection because really nothing works. Uh, chemotherapy doesn't work, radiotherapy doesn't work. Um, and imagine if you miss a metastasis because you haven't bothered to examine the patient properly and the patient simply had a breast mass that told nobody about and you just uh, gave her uh, a focal, focal radiotherapy to emit on, in the brain. Now, the implications when you miss some a lymphoma that is masquerading as uh, a meningioma are tremendous because... So many cases did we have last week? Two. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and this is a very rare tumor. Uh, Primary lymphoma is really very rare. And I, I, I raise my uh, gelatin uh, admiration of the professionalism of uh, Professor Speh, who refuses to operate upon cases that he suspects that they may have a lymphoma because the treatment of choice would be high dose methotrexate. Uh, and the two we attempt. Cases, the two cases were given the same uh, Before we saw them. And we continue saying the same sermon. Uh, we're preaching to the choir. I know that everybody in this room believes exactly what we're saying. But this pattern of malpractice continues to happen. Um, the problem of giving steroids beforehand is that when you actually get to the biopsy, you may see nothing. And if the, this mass disappears completely, this is not a good thing because you can't get the diagnosis. The lymphoma would come back in a, to, uh, with vengeance and kill the patient. The reason why we emphasize the lymphoma <coughs> theme, be it primary, particular primary sense lymphoma when the, we've stopped uh, in, uh, second involvement by systemic lymphoma, is the treatment is so radically different where the mainstay is high dose methotrexate in an attempt to delay radiotherapy as much as possible, and it's definitely not surgical. Um, and these cases happen, and they happen masquerading in the most unusual of cases. On the same theme, sarcoid uh, can be missed and can be given serotactic radiotherapy, and the patient would succumb to something that would have been treated properly with steroids once you have made the diagnosis. 
And the problem is differentiating pathologically cell codes from lymphoma may not necessarily be a very easy thing, particularly for patients who were treated with, with steroids. And I really don't, don't understand the rationale for giving steroids uh, when you haven't had the diagnosis. And if you really are worried about the mass effect, this is why there is something called management, for God's sake. And I'm not talking about life-saving measures where you really have to give the steroids because the patient is in pending animation, etc. Uh, I'm talking about things that you really could have bought time uh, uh, by getting the diagnosis. Again, the, the, the pattern of meds that are missed is a, is a current theme. Now, when it comes to medulloblastomas and ependymomas, the mainstay of treatment would be optimal resection and then radiotherapy, that may be craniospinal in the case of medulloblastoma. And then, uh, depending on the age of the patient, the adjuvant radiotherapy may be delayed, but for adults, radiotherapy and then uh, uh, adjuvant in the form of platinum-based uh, uh, chemotherapy. And if these patients get stereotactic radiotherapy alone, they're going, they're doomed. I mean, they, these patients are treated with keratin time. Um, tuberculoma, for God's sake, we are not in Switzerland where tuberculosis does not exist, though tuberculosis does exist now in Switzerland because of the immigration waves. Uh, tuberculoma is endemic in our part of the world, and it's something that's frequently forgotten. And histocytosis, you let the patient succumb to dying of histocytosis. What happens with cystic radiotherapy in the form of gamma is that there's no pathological proof, then the stable thing, the patient would succumb to a mysterious illness that, that led to his demise, and no, of course, postpartum, postmortem was not done. And uh, the evidence is better with the patient. You did not have a proof histologically and you don't have uh, a, a post-mortem. So how can you tell what on earth happened? Okay. And this malpractice continues to occur on a daily basis. <coughs> Some of the cases, illustrative cases, this upper clivus cavernous sinus before surgery and after, and this is the operative finding. And this lady with the tumor inside the brain stem, Dr. Asar, I asked, what would you do to this? I tried to push her away, she did not do. She just came to me. I asked her if she can travel abroad, she did not want to. I wanted to travel abroad, I couldn't, so I had to put it. So this is really a formidable case. And I put it upon her. She came up with some right-sided weakness, but then she recovered from feet from there's a little bit of something contrasting here, but it is not changing, so I'm not rushing to treat that. 32-year-old with this extensive tumor, for and after. So it is not one or two cases, this is a school of thought. This very formidable tumor, before and after. And the patient, this is the incision. And I always do a small cortical incision here to get the air outside and to be an emergency entry if they develop hydrocephalus. Before and after. This was done surgically. They have not removed the tumor, they have removed the cerebellum. And they say, oh, well, it's in there for radiation. Of course, you cannot give radiation to this, so we operate it. So even in cases that has been operated before, you still can operate. Before and after, before and after, this lady also, <coughs> before and after, and for now. I'll just show you one or two videos and we'll be finished. Yeah, Professor, before you have a question, yes. is there a line or something you can tell for those tumors that are in big as a brace thing? Now, this is the difference, line of difference between the uh, tumor and the brain stem. I'm not speaking about the cases of the double arachnoid. Let's about the other cases where you are triggered. No, you can't. So what do you do in these cases? I will just go and do my best and if I find that I'm defeated, I accept defeat. Okay. So sometimes you just cannot differentiate. Thank you. Uh, this is the case where the tumor was inside the brain stem. Yes. You see? This is the lady I showed. I want to kick her away, but she did not know. So this is a piece of the tumor inside. But I still could find a good kind of cleavage. So it looked formidable first, but then it was okay. Yes. 
and it can just show some pictures like that, you know. Your sitting position, we are on the right side, this is midline on the right side. I'm showing you the tangent nerve. I'm showing you also sit nerve inside, this is the tumor. So you work in between the nerves. Superior vitreous and vein, vein of dandy. And here we're moving opposites from the surface of the brain. Because you know where they are because you know the anatomy and because you know the classification you would expect where to find the structures using the ultrasonic respirator here moving the tumor from the, ac the accessory nerve okay, another one this is retinal artery And uh, this is the tumor, this is the facial nerve, so again you would have to work between the tumor, between nerves, here yeah, between the facial and the trigeminal here, yeah, taking the tumor out of its origin from the dorsum cilli. This is the origin. And in sitting position everything flows down, so you have no problem. This is the oculomotor nerve, I think it's on the sinus. This is this is the origin of the tumor. Once you control that, you have uh, won the case. Here is the third one. Trigeminal and the facial. And here you will soon see the sickness. This little arachnoid here contains the sickness. But I know where to find the sickness. And of course the sect and the sect and so on. So this is the end of it. There's some cellulite clear. The stroke going into the pituitary gland. Third nerve going to the cavernous sinus. Beautiful anatomy created by the tumor. Would there be clear nerve deficits if you keep? No. They would not be. No. Anymore. In this way, this patient did not have any clear nerve deficits. Uh, I think we'll finish. We'll really stop there. And uh, I just want to thank all the people in this hospital, nurses, doctors, radiologists, everybody, because they are the ones uh, that give me this chance to have successful surgery. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions, any comments? Please, Dr. Rock. Thank you. Thank you. قبل الأسبوع كنا في لجنة المصطلحات الطبية في مجمع الدول العربية وحاولنا نجد المدلول الذي يحاكي كلمة مديون فقلت لهم سأسأل الدكتور إبراهيم السبيح لأنه هو مختص في هذه الكلمة ما هو المدلول المدق في كلمة مديون متواضع متواضع لا لا مديوكر هو المهرج مهرج المرضى تبغون هل نقول هنا شبه شبه جراح اشبال جراح يا ريت رفعنا قيمتهم ما هي الكلمه التي اصلا جراح مهرج First of all, thank you, Dr. Speh. Yeah, we are lucky to have you with us and this very nice lecture. Uh, أنا ما بنسى الحالة اللي بعت لك إياها مرة تانية years back وكان بعت لي إياها بين a case of change of behavior كانت almost my diagnosis حيكون شيزوفرينيا ولو إنه أنا بفحص لقيت في something wrong فطلبت MRI ولقيت a huge frontal lobe tumor وكان حجم البرداني وبتذكر يومها دقيت علي قلت لي تعالي اتفرج شو طلعت لك بالراسها وناو شيز a wonderful lady كانت 
أستاذ كبيرة والحمد لله كملت حياتها. Second thing I I noticed the chief there is certain patient there is no changes in their meningiomas. Is there a certain behavior or it's a sort of luck for these patients? Sort of luck. Secondly, this patient if I found this lesion. Should she have a treatment, antiepileptic, or anything, or just observe and see? No, just observe. Okay, thank you. Okay, if not, no more questions.